This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Uh, Welcome to This Week in Virology. This is episode 188, and we are recording on Thursday. It's June 14th, 2012. It's my wife's birthday today, by the way. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Doris. Yeah, I know you're upset that I'm here, but (laughs) (laughs) I'm not very good at keeping a calendar. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIB, the podcast all about viruses. And today, we are on the road again. TWIB really gets around. Today, we are in Scotland. We are at the Center for Virus Research at the University of Glasgow. And I'm here uh, to, to uh, I, yesterday I gave a talk here uh, and uh, was the recipient of a very nice award which you'll hear about separately uh, and I have a crew of local individuals and one individual who is not so local and we're going to talk about viruses today. So let me introduce uh, our panel. Uh, let's start with the chair or the head of the virology uh, center here at the university, Massimo Palmarini. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for uh, having me and for allowing us to do TWIV, the first from Scotland, right? The first TWIV from Scotland. That's our fame to claim from now on. <laughs> the first but not the last, <laughs> right? So I was talking with Vanessa earlier, and we thought that when your new building is done, maybe we could come back and uh, do a podcast from there. That would be great. And we'll pay for it that time because hopefully by, <laughs> then, hopefully by then we'll have some funds raised and I can bring some, some technicians along with us. Also joining us today, and you have to tell me if I get your titles right or not because I got them from the website and I understand it's not up to date. Uh, uh, Emma Thompson, I understand you're a clinical senior lecturer. That's right. Welcome. Good morning. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Uh, I know this may be stressful for a lot of you, but... Uh, it's really just a conversation, so don't worry about it. Also joining us today, uh, who I understand is an honorary lecturer, John McLaughlin. Yes, good morning, Vincent. Yep. Uh, are you an honorary lecturer? I'm an honorary lecturer, but I also have a role here as associate director for the, for the CVR. And in, in at last night's dinner, your role was to order the single malt for me. <laughs> it was, and, and I think we enjoyed a couple of very nice single malts. It is really good. Do you remember which one we got? We had a uh, Carlila. You drank a Carlila, a, a 12-year-old Carlila. Yeah, it was very nice. Just um, one, only <laughs> one, <laughs> because I had to work today. So and I had an Anok. It was very good, John. I did try the haggis, you know. I was swore only, I wasn't going to. Only v- very little. <laughs> I would have eaten your plate. Actually, it's very good. <laughs> only like very little. <laughs> and also joining us today uh, from the World Health Organization in Geneva. Uh, she is a medical officer, Hande Harmanje. Impressed. Thank you. Is yes, it good? good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> very good. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and also we have, I'd like to mention, uh, Steve in the back there doing the audio for us. Thanks, Steve. Had a great chat with Steve earlier. You guys are lucky to have a really good audio person here. So if you need something, he's the go-to guy. Really good. So he's doing a backup recording for us with these uh, ma- mics that are sitting on the desk. Now, before we go on, uh, listeners of TWIV, what do we have to do before we start talking about science? Anybody listen to TWIV here? By, by the way, we have a wonderful audience here. Uh, and tell me who listens to TWIV. Raise your hand. Only one, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. I did occasionally. You don't have to listen to everyone, but you should check it out. It's pretty cool. If you like viruses, you would, you would like it. But listeners of TWIV know that before we do science, what do we talk about? The weather. The weather. <laughs> <laughs> what is the weather here in Glasgow? Does anyone know, Massimo? Wonderful. It's always sunny and... Uh, <laughs> It's very, it's very warm, so we really uh, want to inspire all the PhD students and uh, talented postdoc to come to Glasgow because it's always a very, very nice weather. <laughs> and, with, and with climate change, we're getting better and better. <laughs> so <we're laughs> Yesterday was beautiful, sunny, which is unusual. Today it's a bit cloudy. I would guess it's probably 20 degrees centigrade. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, it's the weather. Uh, before we actually start talking about science here, uh, I want to just mention the passing of a virologist. You know, um, virologists are like everyone else. We age and we, we pass from this world. And uh, on June 5th, I believe, Aaron Chatkin passed away. Uh, Aaron Chatkin, a well-known virologist, he discovered the cap structure on mRNAs. And he discovered it with real viruses uh, many years ago in the 70s, I believe. And that, of course, led to our current understanding of how mRNAs are translated because cellular mRNAs also have a cap structure as well. Um, I have written a little personal remembrance of uh, Aaron on my blog, which I'll put a link to in the show notes. Uh, Aaron um, was a good friend of mine. Um, I actually interviewed with Aaron for a postdoc years ago in 1979, I think it would have been. He was the first person to offer me a postdoc. And uh, I didn't go to his lab, of course, but I remember a good visit with him. Uh, and then um, in 1989, when I moved to New Jersey from Manhattan, it turned out that he was my neighbor. He lived around the corner from me in a very small town in New Jersey, so it's unusual that they would have two scientists in one town. But I would often see Aaron jogging past my home on Saturday mornings. And even as a sh little as a year ago, he, uh, he jogged by and he would stop and uh, talk. So that's Aaron Chatkin at 77 years old. We'll miss you, uh, Aaron. So uh, I'd like to go around and just before we talk about science, just explore your backgrounds and how you got to being here today, not on a plane or anything like that, but just your career. So Massimo, I know you're originally from Italy. Yep. yep. Uh, but um, where did you get your scientific training? I, I'm a veterinarian, and I, so I graduated in veterinary medicine in Perugia, which is a lovely medieval town in, uh, in Umbria in Italy, and then uh, started to work in Rome, and then I did uh, a PhD. I moved to Edinburgh to do a PhD there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I met my wife and then we moved to the States and I've been uh, f almost four years at the uh, University of California, Irvine. Who did you work with there? With uh, Hank Fan okay. as, a, as a Cancer Research Institute and, uh, and then uh, became an assistant professor in, uh, and moved to the University of Georgia at the School of Veterinary Medicine there. And, um, and then in the meantime, my children started to grow and so we uh, the pull from uh, from Scotland was too strong to resist them, so we came back uh, and uh, we joined the I joined the veterinary school in uh, in here in Glasgow as uh, as a professor. So the, is the veterinary school right here also on this campus? It's, it's not right here on the campus. It's a lovely uh, campus just 10 minutes away, the Gas Cube Estate. Okay. So in Glasgow there is the, the, the veterinary school and the bits on the Cancer Research Institute. And that's where the new building for the Center for Viral Research will be built. And so this campus is the undergraduate campus, more it, or less? It's, uh, the, the, it's, the, it's, the main, it's the main campus. It is the medical school, the science, engineering, and arts okay. of, of the University of Glasgow. So the plan is to move the, this building, which has a lot of virology in it, over to the other campus eventually? That's correct. Where where, well, there are already uh, more or less half of the virologists, uh, mainly from the animal side. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about what you do as well uh, later on. But Emma, how about you? What's your training? So um, I studied medicine here in Glasgow University. And so you were born in Scotland? Born in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Okay. I came across to Glasgow and uh, studied medicine here. And then a science degree, undergraduate degree at the same time. And then um, worked for a couple of years in Glasgow as a junior doctor. And then uh, did my specialist training down in London in infectious diseases, um, working all across London at the Royal Free Hospital, the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, and then St. Mary's Hospital, uh, where I spent a lot of time working with Jonathan Weber and Janice Main and Mark Thurs um, at Imperial College, so St. Mary's is part of that. And uh, during my time there, I was very interested in HIV, and uh, we noticed a, an outbreak of hepatitis C infection in men who have sex with men. And uh, so I got very interested in that and found a cohort of patients and then did a PhD um, using this cohort uh, at Imperial College and then Oxford University. Um, mm -hmm. So co-supervised by Paul Klenerman uh, and Peter Karianis at Imperial. And then after that, uh, I did a year as a 
locum consultant down in infectious diseases down in London, along with a kind of postdoc uh, at the same time in Oxford. So I kind of commuted between, lived in Reading actually, and commuted each way. Um, and then I was offered a job at uh, the Centre for Virus Research and uh, came back up to Scotland as a clinical senior lecturer in October last year. How long have you been uh, here at this centre? Just uh, over six months. Six months. Oh, yeah. really? you've, so you've, you've moved around a lot. You've had quite a varied training, right? Mm. Yes. Yeah, no, I think I'm lucky to have uh, trained, I think, in, in infectious diseases in London. It is a fantastic place because you see all sorts of imported infections and, um, uh, yeah, it's been very good. And then I spent time in Oxford uh, learning a little bit of immunology and... Uh, probably discovered my, my main interest was actually in virology and came up here to the Center for Virus Research. John, well, you're a young guy, where, where have you been? Yeah, so I, um, I guess I was lucky, I was born in paradise, so I never left it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was born in Glasgow, um, raised in Glasgow, uh, did my d degree in the city, um, did my PhD here in, in virology, and I guess life has been very good here and I never left. So. I've been here for more than 30 years. Um, I did my PhD with Barclay Clements, working on herpes simplex virus. I then continued to work with Barclay um, probably for about another um, 14 or 15 years, in fact. So I was with him for a long time. And then in the mid-90s, um, we were establishing a new programme here on hepatitis viruses. Um, and so myself and my colleague in the audience, Arvind Patel, and we set up um, programs on hepatitis C here. Um, and we've been working on the virus ever since then. Um, and I guess I've, um, I've also been appointed for my sins by uh, Massimo to be associate director. So um, it means that uh, you know, I help him also to, to run the, the centre here. It's interesting that uh, you, have, you were born and raised here. You're local and you're yeah. still here. But in my discussions with many of the students and postdocs over the past day, that is not typical any longer. It's more typical to move around because it's harder and harder to, yeah. to find such positions, right? Yeah. No, I think I've been very fortunate to be able to have a, a job um, and a career which actually has spanned so long in one institute, but at the same time has been quite varied. So I guess I started my career in the very early days of molecular biology um, and I've seen and molecular virology and have seen that as a subject really grow and develop and all the technological advances that have come along with it. So um, I've been very fortunate actually to be able to stay here for so long and, and work with so many very, very good colleagues, very interesting people. It's good to have a perspective of a field like that. Not everyone does and so um, it should be appreciated. You, you know, folks who uh, don't know that you, some of you may not know that certain people have been around a long time and have a perspective. They're also va they're often valuable at uh, providing overviews. I, I really appreciate that, and those individuals aren't with us forever. I'm not saying you're going to pass, away. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to take advantage of them. One thing I always wanted to do with Aaron Chatkin was record a podcast with him and talk about the early days of discovering a cap, and I never did. So I regret that, and I, I have made it an effort to try and record as many as I can with uh, people who have been around a while. Um, uh, Hande, where, where have you come from to be here today? You're the one person I really don't know on this panel, so uh, this is going to be totally exploratory. It's How going to be exciting for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I work for the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, now in the Global Hepatitis Program. Um, but before I came to Geneva, I worked in my home country in Turkey uh, as a university professor in public health. And my background is a medical doctor and specialist in community medicine and public health. Um, I held a sort of a double appointment at the university at that time for about almost like 18, 19 years. I had the, the teaching uh, hat and research hat, but I also had a more public health hands-on uh, field work hat where I had to, um, I had the responsibility of running as deputy health director, 
the health services of a municipality in Istanbul of, with about half a million inhabitants, 16 health centers, family planning clinics, etc. So that was where I got most of my public health experience. And um, at one point in my life, it was like t 2003 or something, I received a phone call from a colleague working in WHO who um, asked me to do a consultancy for him. And that's how my um, contact with WHO began. I worked as an outside consultant for about two and a half years, traveling all over the world, setting up a training network for them and with them, of course. Uh, and then um, there was a job opening. I applied and I got into the system in 2005. Um, first in the Department of Human Resources for Health, and then I moved into the influenza program, the global influenza program, where I worked for about five years. We went through the pandemic together, and uh, now that the hepatitis system, uh, the unit is established, I asked to be moved to the hepatitis program, and I was given that opportunity. Now I'm the global hepatitis program since December 2011. So when was the hepatitis program established at WHO? December 2011. Just December? Yes, it's that's very correct. new. Yes, we had hepatitis-related work, of course, going on in WHO, but uh, that was mostly focused on Hep B vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, in, in 2010, the member states of the WHO uh, passed a resolution at the World Health Assembly, and that mandated WHO secretariat, mm -hmm. the, the people working there, us, to set up uh, a program and look at hepatitis, viral hepatitis, from a more comprehensive perspective. So uh, following that mandate, the Global Hepatitis Program was formed six months ago. So does this cover all viral hepatitides or just some it of It does them? cover all, all viral hepatitides, yes. That's how I was taught in <laughs> graduate school. We had physicians teaching us microbiology. And the one guy whose name is escaping me called them hepatitides. Is that correct? Uh? I'm Italian, I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I, always say I know how, to, how it's written, but <laughs> yeah. I guess that's how you say it. A, B, C, D and E. D and E, yes, and whatever right. else is out there that yeah. we don't know about. Okay. So what, uh, before I talk about that a little bit, what, uh, if someone today wants to work at WHO, what, what advice would you give them? Get some experience, first of all. You can't just go there and get a job. You have to do something else. Well. There are different ways of working with WHO. Mm -hmm. One of them at uh, the student level would be to work there as an intern and to really get an understanding of what's happening, how it's working, um, and how WHO is actually ticking. Um, and if you're a student somewhere, be it undergraduate, postgraduate, or graduate, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be a student to be able to go there and work as an intern. And I think as an intern, you can only work there like um, out, up to three months, um, sometimes extended periods of time. But but uh, interning is completely um, free, so you have to be self-funded or get a scholarship or something. So, but that that's a good opportunity for people to actually get a first-hand information on how everything's working in WHO. You are usually you would be given a very specific project that you would be able to finish in that period of time. And then, you know, it gives you a sense of satisfaction also to finalize a project uh, and then deliver it to, to the people. So that's one way. Uh, another way is working as a consultant. And that is you have to be a certain uh, an expert in something. And WHO needs to know that. And they contact you and they, they hire you for producing things like reports systematic reviews, uh, background papers, draft guidance documents, etc. And that is external work. And to be a staff member, you have to uh, follow, first of all, the employment uh, notices at the website and, and just apply. And what WHO does is it usually takes people with a certain amount of experience. So that's why the, the age, the average age there is like 47, 48. So um, it's, it's sort of a like upper middle career uh, step uh, in a person's life, I would say. So what, why did WHO establish a global hepatitis program? Um, well, the way that we work is we listen to what our member states tell us. 
at the World Health Assembly every year. So they get together. We have nine, 194 member states. They get together at the World Health Assembly, and they uh, discuss certain areas. They set priorities, and then they mandate the secretariat to, um, to follow these recommendations. So in 2010, uh, with the sponsorship of three countries, they, the assembly accepted this um, resolution, 63.18, uh, it is uh, on prevention and control of viral hepatitis. So it just means that the member states noticed that the extent of problem uh, that viral hepatitis is causing globally, and they asked us, the secretariat, the technical people, to do something about it, to bring all the people together, to mobilize resources, to uh, set guidelines, to um, just, yeah, collaborate with everybody, all the players and other UN agencies in that area. Uh, that, that's why the, the program was established. And the first thing that we decided to do is to come up with a strategic framework. And this, this was going to be the, the first comprehensive uh, plan of WHO on viral hepatitis. Um, and that's what we worked on and it's currently routing through clearance and we will launch it uh, on the World Hepatitis Day on July the 28th this year and it's going to set up the scene for WHO's future work in, in viral hepatitis prevention and control. So can you give us a sense of the global hepatitis problem, what kinds of numbers, what, kind of, what countries are involved? Well, it's everywhere. So, I mean, you, WHO usually works in more developing countries mm -hmm. to set up systems and problems uh, programs. But hepatitis is um, it's peculiar in the sense that it is a developing country problem as much as a developed country problem. Uh, so, in that sense, I think we will the whole world is our playground in, in viral hepatitis. Of course, the changes like Hep C and B is more. Um, developed and have E and A is more developing, but then it's, it's also you see A and E everywhere and B and C everywhere also. We are, um, I mean, the classic numbers that we cite all the time is um, uh, that there are 500 million people living with chronic hepatitis B and C. So that's, that's a huge number, but we are working on new numbers right now. So the new prevalence figures are coming out and we are working with modelers to come up with mortality figures on Hep B and C. Since it's a um, chronic disease, it, it, it is more difficult to calculate all those numbers and, and come up with valid numbers. But this is one of the things that our program is going to come up with, I mm -hmm. hope, with more valid numbers about the real um, uh, extent of the problem in the world. So I, I know from the polio eradication effort that WHO has reference laboratories around the world where uh, samples are taken and you, we look, they, they look for which serotypes are involved. So will a similar thing be done with, with hepatitis? Um, we are very new. We have a full, I mean, a we have very full work plan mm -hmm. and agenda in front of us. We will need to work with laboratories, definitely. And there is a lot of issues that we have to work around diagnostics, the, vi the virus itself, and all that. But we haven't yet started specifically working to produce reference laboratories. But what WHO does is we work with centers of excellence globally, and um, some of them become collaborating centers for us. So we are actually looking to, to uh, create and to encourage people to become partners with WHO in all areas related to viral hepatitis and also to become uh, collaborating centers if they wish to uh, take that. Uh, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very official uh, position with WHO to become a collaborating center and it, it is people sign contracts. It's like a contractual <coughs> agreement um, and you have to be, you promise or you commit to undertaking um, activities with and for WHO during the designation period. And we are certainly going looking into uh, ways of increasing uh, collaborating centers in viral hepatitis, and that is one of the reasons that I'm here in Glasgow uh, to see if we can actually partner up in viral hepatitis. So there's a substantial hep C presence here at the Institute, right? Yes. 
Yeah, and so that's great. something you're going to explore to see if you can. Definitely, perhaps yes. these two individuals who are with us today might be involved as well and others. Well, we're looking for more and more partners. I mean, yeah. we cannot do this alone. Even if we are 50 people in WHO, which we are not, uh, we will need sure. people to work together. It's, it's a huge problem, and we will need to work with many people. Massimo had mentioned that there's a problem here in Scotland with Hep C, right? That's right. That's right. I think the incidence of Hep C in, um, in Scotland is higher than the rest of the UK. Maybe you got better figures. Yeah, it, it is higher here in, the, in Scotland than uh, across the rest of the, the UK. That's primarily because we have a problem in the intravenous drug user population. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Scotland we have probably approaching 40,000 to 50,000 people who are infected. The real problem that we have is we don't know exactly how many people are infected. Um, and this is the real difficulty with hepatitis C is diagnosis of, of infection. Um, it's very often been refer referred to as the silent epidemic and I think that's a, I think that's a very apt title for, for, the, for, the, for this type of viral infection. So here in, in, in Scotland we have a problem. Here in the city we also have a particular problem. The real sort of centre for, I would almost say, hepatitis C infection in the UK is in, is in Glasgow in many respects. And again, this is a problem with, with the intravenous drug user population. Um, so, but across the UK, um, in, in total, we maybe have about 250,000 people who are infected. And again, at the moment, we only know of about 100,000 who, who carry or have been infected with the virus. So even in a developed country, um, there are clear problems of identifying those who are infected and that clearly then leads to difficulties further down the line when these people are diagnosed because very often by that point um, they've reached a stage in the infection where disease has developed and that makes them more difficult to treat um, and also um, it makes them more expensive to treat because very often they, they require more hospitalisation for example. Um, so really trying to diagnose is a, is a big issue trying to diagnose people early on when they've had infection, which means that you can treat them much more um, earlier. It means they've, they've probably got a better chance of responding to therapy um, and also um, less of a chance of developing disease um, um, because this disease can take 20 to 30 years to develop before um, there's any form of liver disease. So how is the infection diagnosed at the moment? What is the test? At the moment, the test is by um, PCR, um, um, primarily, but also by... Um, by we, we tend to screen with an antibody, third generation um, antibody test, and then back that up with a, a PCR test. Um, using serum, I presume, right? Uh, using blood. serum, yeah. yeah. Although um, there's been a recent initiative to screen intravenous drug users in the Scottish population by using blood spot uh, testing, where they just, you know, uh, it's done in the community rather than... Um, patients having to come into yeah, yeah. hospitals, which uh, is often a problem with intravenous drug users. Uh, trying to get them to come in mm -hmm. uh, is difficult. So is a blood spot test work? Is it reliable? It seems very reliable and actually we've been working on these uh, blood spots here at the Institute and uh, we've um, worked out a way of amplifying the whole genome from a blood spot. So as long as you do it in small fragments, uh, right. because the RNA obviously gets fragmented uh, over time and it is possible to in fact amplify the entire genome. So the main at-risk population is intravenous drug users? In, in Scotland that's by far the most uh, at-risk population uh, and in the, the UK as a whole. Um, but we do have other populations as well. Um, we have a significant number of people who have come here from other countries and uh, been infected often through medical procedures and so on, right. uh, dentistry, um, and uh, occasionally things like scarification, you know. Um, right. And um, we also have seen outbreaks in other populations, and the one that I've had an interest in has been in uh, HIV-positive men who have sex with men, and uh, they, they, there has been a, an emerging epidemic in that population. Um, almost certainly sexually transmitted, um, mm -hmm. and this virus was not previously thought to be uh, se efficiently transmitted sexually, but uh, in gay men it does seem to be. Um, uh, so there are a variety of different groups of, of people with hepatitis C in the UK, but intravenous drug use is by far the most common. So do we know if that 
in that population it's because they're immunosuppressed or is it some other factor that we don't understand? In the HIV? Yeah. 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 Well, I suspect what well, we don't know. Um, the behavior is different in that population. So um, we know that men who have sex with men who get hepatitis C um, have far more sexual partners. Um, they tend to take part in more risky sexual exposures. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a, a reasonable amount of recreational drug use, although that tends to be intranasal use of drugs um, rather than intravenous use of drugs. Um, uh, but it isn't happening uh, to the same extent in very sexually active gay men who are HIV negative. So it seems very likely that HIV itself does play a role. Um, that role must be fairly quick because what we do see pretty commonly is co-infection with both viruses. So we see HIV and hepatitis C um, uh, in something like 10% of, of the cohort that I look after. So are these in individuals on uh, triple therapy, for example? Yeah, so basically um, this group of, of people have um, a high uh, CD4 count, uh, the, the median CD4 count is 500. Um, about 50% of them are on highly active antiretroviral therapy. 50% are not because they don't need it. Um, uh, but they're, they're relatively immunocompetent individuals, although their immune system must still be perturbed in, yeah, yeah. in some way by the HIV infection. So they may have been infected with both viruses at the same time. Yes, yeah, right. some of them cer almost yeah. certainly have been, yeah. or at least in very close succession. Yeah. So do you treat the hep C infection in these individuals? We do, yes. Um, so we tend to try to get the CD4 count, if, if they do have a lower sort of CD4 count, up to at least 350, because interferon lowers your CD4 count by an average of 140. So we don't want to push people into the danger territory. But yes, we do treat them, and we try to treat them early, because these guys have been picked up during early infection and the likelihood of cure or si sustained virological response is much higher during early infection. So we have a um, success rate in the cohort that I still look after down in London and also I have patients now up in Glasgow as well. Uh, we have a, a success rate of around 80%, um, which is considerably higher than you would expect um, in patients who, you know, who had chronic infection. How do you treat them for hep C? We give them dual therapy with pegylated interferon alpha and ribavirin. Um, there is a question about whether we should now be giving these patients triple therapy with um, the neuroprotease agents. Um, however, the success rates with those are probably are equivalent, although we don't, you know, at least in chronic infection, we don't know um, if giving those during early infection is likely to increase success rates. I suspect it is in those patients who have genotype 1 infection. And then there are some new, and many new antivirals in the pipeline as well, which will be released in the coming years. Which yes. I think that's very exciting. I, I think um, as a clinician treating patients for hepatitis C, we, um, we struggle often with using interferon in, in patients because of its toxicity profile. Um, and there are now, there is now evidence, at least in HIV uninfected uh, cohorts, that uh, newer agents um, can be used even without interferon therapy. And I think that is probably the most exciting development. Um, however, these studies of these newer agents, so there are um, polymerase inhibitors, there are NS5A inhibitors, um, uh, etc. These uh, these have not been studied extensively in HIV positive populations, and we don't know yet what interactions there are likely to be with um, highly active antiretroviral therapy. So that's a good question. If you had, let's say, we have in the future ten antivirals licensed for Hep C, to use these on AIDS patients, would that require an, another clinical study to make sure there weren't uh, adverse effects with retro, antiretrovirals? Yeah, I think so. Use? Yes, yeah. I think that's very important. And I think we need studies looking at the, um, the levels of drugs and interactions and so on in healthy volunteers as well um, uh, before we, we fully understand <laughs> um, what we're likely to do to patients who have both viruses. Is this co-infection, HIV, Hep C, uh, in other parts of the world as well? 
Yeah, I mean, it, so I mean, the, we would estimate, I think, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but about 10 million um, people around the world dual uh, infected. Uh, will wow. be duly infected. Um, but there is the possibility of eradicating Hep C from these people, right? There is, yes. You, but it's expensive. Yeah. Prohibitively expensive, I imagine, in resource-limited settings. Well, the, um, the, the countries that have money should pay for this. We should. Right? Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt about it. We can do that. Mm. But let's say, uh, cost aside, in theory, if the, if the drugs work, the, the virus could be eradicated because it doesn't integrate as does HIV. Because there, there we don't know how to eradicate infection yet, right? That's correct. So there is hope for, for um, both uh, treatment and possibly, I think perhaps a, an even better advance would be a vaccine. Um, for hepatitis C, but uh, we're far, much further behind with that. Yeah, but there have been patients infected with Hep C whose infections have been removed by antiviral treatment oh, so yes. far, right? For sure, so, yes. So that can be done. Yes. Uh, um, although, I mean, there is evidence actually that uh, if you have a sustained virological response and you yeah. um, eradicate the virus, there may still be a very small amount present in the liver. Um, however, that doesn't seem to cause clinical problems. Mm -hmm. So effectively, you can cure this. And we actually have an email later about vaccines, so maybe we'll, we'll talk about that then. But uh, just using antivirals alone, I asked you this last night, could we eradicate hep C? So hep C is on, only infects people as far as we know, correct? Yeah. There's no animal reservoir. So that's one of the requirements for eradication. Um, then the other requirement was a uh, limited number of serotypes, because that's if you use a vaccine, you have to have a limited. And so for polio, there were three serotypes, so, so that fit the bill. So for hep C, could you eradicate with just antivirals? Theoretically. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't grow resistant. Yes. Yeah. The virus right. mutates very rapidly. It's an RNA virus. and. Uh, almost as soon as a new drug is released, uh, resistance mutations are reported. For monotherapy, right? Um, uh, for 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 more, not just for monotherapy, but for people treated with with uh, three agents. Um, so um, we do know that there are resistance mutations circulating. Um, so in people uh, who've had triple therapy. Triple example. therapy of the protease inhibitor, ribavirin, and interferon. And interferon. But what we don't know is if we have three novel antivirals, and not including interferon and ribavirin, which seem to be a weak, the weak part of the therapy. If you have a protease inhibitor, a polymerase inhibitor, an S5 inhibitor, say, maybe then the, the mutation rate would be manageable. Because with yes. HIV, it's, that's the case, right? Sure, yes, that's right, so, so certainly. But I think it would be unwise to, to mm -hmm. um, uh, not to expect the virus to mutate, and uh, for for resistance mutations, the you know almost certainly will start circulating. So if we have a big armamentarium of antivirals like we do for AIDS, then we do a triple therapy, and if you have resistance, then you change the combination. So that's a good argument for having many anti-Hep C drugs. Mm. Right? I can't I can't imagine full eradication without a vaccine, though. Mm -hmm. It is theoretically possible. But yeah, it's theoretically, but it's difficult and expensive to use just antivirals. And it's really, uh, if you have a vaccine, you, you shouldn't depend on antivirals, right? But, uh, I mean, I, I presume, well, well, we'll talk about vaccines when we read the email later, because that's an important part of it uh, as well. Um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to ask is, so if someone has AIDS, would they sh should they be automatically screened for hep C? Yes, because the route of transmission is often the same and people acquire both viruses in the same way, so yes. Okay, then there's a population globally that is not at risk for intravenous drug use. They, are not, they don't have AIDS. They are uh, other people who may acquire hep C by other means. But you don't pick that up until it's clinically apparent, right? Mm, that's right. So the majority of people around the world have um, chronic hepatitis C infection. And as John says, it's a silent epidemic. And in HIV-positive people, it's a sleeping dragon waiting to rear its head because um, we are now getting very good at treating HIV. But hepatitis is now overtaking AIDS-defining illnesses as a cause of morbidity and mortality. 
in HIV positive populations. So we really have to look out for hepatitis viruses. In fact, in the U.S., I know there's an article on this, uh, Hep C is now eclipsing uh, AIDS as the main cause of, of death by infectious disease. Mm -hmm. And so that signals that we need to get moving on that. So we have a good Hep B vaccine. And so how does WHO use that to deal with Hep B globally? Well, the Hep, hep B vaccine has been, um, WHO has been promoting it for more than 20 years now, I believe. And there isn't um, any country in the world that hasn't taken it into its immunization schedule. Now, what WHO is doing is to try to push for um, the birth dose. So giving uh, children the first dose of the Hep B vaccine in the first 24 uh, hours of life. Mm -hmm. And that is um, for mother-to-child transmission. So that's, that's the current strategy. That's what it's pushing for uh, currently for Hep B vaccine. It's interesting. We have, we have discussed Hep B quite a bit on TWIV, and we often have email from people asking why they should immunize their kids with Hep B vaccine. Because many people don't, don't recognize um, the importance of immunization and the possibility of transmission. And we have told them that it can be, obviously the disease can be very serious, but you don't just have to work with uh, or be in a healthcare setting to be immunized, right? There are other risks as well. Oh, definitely. Um, John, according to your website, you work on four different aspects of hep C. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if those, those are all correct, but maybe you should Give us a sense of what you work on. What's, what are the important problems that you work on with respect to hep C in your lab? So in my lab, um, I mean, I, so I'm a molecular virologist. I'm not a clinician. I'm a, I'm a scientist. So I have various areas in hepatitis C that I'm interested in, primarily using the in vitro systems that we have, which we know are, do not tell us the complete picture in terms of the natural progression in, in, of infection. But these are the best models that we currently have. So I study um, um, the core protein, which is the one which forms the capsid. Um, and that has an interesting property in that it binds to these structures called lipid droplets, which are storage organelles in the, in, in the cell. Um, and hepatitis C is rather unusual in making use of you know, that, that type of organelle. It's always been thought that these organelles are relatively inert and don't do very much, but in actual fact, more and more they've been recognised as important players in the life cycle of, of the cell. And there are more viruses now which seem to make use of lipid droplets in various ways. Are these lipid droplets in all cells? Um, they, they, are, they are in most cells, not in all cells, um, but, it's, um, but there's probably lipid storage in most cells. But uh, in particular, in, in liver cells, you do find that there are storage organelles. And do, does the virus induce their formation or, or increase their number in cells? Yes, it's thought, that the, it's thought that the virus does increase their number. I mean, one thing that we see in natural infections, so hepatitis C exists as seven different genotypes. Um, and in particular, in genotype 3, and we see a lot of genotype 3 infections in the UK. Almost half of our infections are genotype 3. And that causes a condition in patients cause, called steatosis. Now, we see steatosis in, with other genotypes um, um, in people who are infected. But in the case of genotype 3, it looks as though the, the, the virus itself causes this um, steatosis, which is, liver, which is lipid accumulation in, in the liver. Um, and that then can actually lead or, um, or predispose patients to then developing um, um, liver disease. But going back to these lipid droplet structures, at least in terms of how they function um, in the virus life cycle from the in vitro models, is that we have the, the core protein, which I said that it forms a capsid, which um, binds to these structures. And it's thought that that may be a route for the virus to enter into um, the assembly pathway for very low density lipoprotein. Because when we look at virus and serum, then it's attached to, to lipoprotein. Um, and these lipid droplets actively participate in the VLDL assembly pathway. Um, so it's thought that that may be a route in for the virus to actually acquire lipoprotein during the assembly and secretion pathway um, out of the cell. Um, so we've been studying that for some time. Um, we have identified a particular domain in the core protein which, is, um, which attaches the, 
the, the protein to the to these lipid droplets and it's not found in other related viruses for example in the flaviviruses or the pestiviruses and that domain is missing and I think that's quite interesting because it says something about hepatitis C which makes it distinctive from the other members of the flaviviridae family so we've been looking at, at, at that aspect of, of, of core this is a conserved domain among all seven serotypes, I presume. It's conserved. It's in fact, it's one of the most conserved parts of hepatitis C. So that tells us that it's presumably something which plays a very important role in, in the virus life cycle. So remind me, do we have the structure of core? We don't have the entire structure for core, but we do have, we now have good evidence on the structure for this domain in core which attaches the protein to droplets. So it, it's composed of two alpha helices which are amphipathic in nature and it's thought that the hydrophobic residues in those helices are responsible for attaching core directly to, to lipid. I presume they're on the surface of the particle, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so they're on the surface of the particle. So they probably interact with the, the phospholipid layer which um, coats the, the surface of the lipid droplet. Can you alter this sequence and look at the consequence on infection? Yes, you can do that with the in vitro models that we have. So we have done quite a lot of work, as have other groups, on making mutations in this domain and then looking at the effect that that has um, on targeting and then on assembly and release and production of infectious virus. But we've also been looking at making more subtle changes which not only change the targeting of the protein, but also change the, the, the dynamics of the protein on the surface of the droplet. One of the other things that interests me is the movement and the, and the dynamics of, of um, and proteins and RNA, for example, in, in cells. So we've been able to make very subtle changes to this domain, um, which do not change the targeting of the protein, but change the mobility of the protein on the surface of, of the droplet. And that's something that we can follow um, um, using um, biophysical methods combined with live cell technology. And what we've been able to show there is that uh, if we actually bind the protein more tightly to the lipid droplet, we can actually block virus production. And what we think is happening there is that the whole dynamics of the system is such that the, the protein has to not only target to the droplet, but it also has to leave the droplet to participate in virus assembly. And that's the hypothesis that we are following at the moment. So uh, give us a picture of this. So there's a domain on the, ca on the core surface that's interacting with lipid droplets, but what part of the lipid droplet, what constituent of the lipid droplet is it interacting with? Do we know that? We don't really know that. We assume that it's interacting with um, phospholipid, which coats the surface, but we don't really know whether or not it interacts with the, the hydrophobic core. So the, so the lipid droplet is made up mainly of triglyceride and cholesterol ester, and that's then bounded by a, this layer of phospholipid, and then there's protein coating the, the entire surface. Um, so we don't know whether or not those interactions extend be much below the phospholipid layer. We think there possibly might be some um, interactions, but it's important to maybe consider that this interaction with the lipid droplet surface by this domain um, seems to really, it really seems to sit on the surface, so we don't know just to what extent it penetrates into, into the core. And we imagine that that penetration not, is not really very, very much in actual fact. And, and that's part of the reason why the protein is mobile on the surface of a droplet, why it can go on and why it can, can come back off again. Um, again, if you bind too tightly to lipid, then you probably restrict move, movement and mobility. So you said the lipid droplets are also coated with protein? This yeah. is a cellular protein. I These are cellular that. proteins, and, and in fact, the proteome of lipid droplets has now been studied in some detail. And um, whereas before we thought that, as I said earlier, they were relatively inert. In fact, they have they always thought to have simply storage proteins on the surface. But we now see that they have signaling molecules which sit on the surface. There are um, various lipases which sit on the surface. So in actual fact, um, as an organelle, they've generated a great deal of interest in recent times. Um, um, partly because they're involved in disease, apart from hepatitis C, they're involved in other diseases as well, um, but also because they seem to play an important part in some of these signaling pathways also in the, in the cell. So none of those lipid droplet proteins interact with core? 
Um, from the data that we have, we don't we haven't seen interactions, but some other people have seem to have identified interactions. But um, it's not something that we've been able to, to to verify from our studies. So, are the is the genesis of these droplets in cells understood so that you could interfere with their production and see the effect? Uh, we don't understand so much about how they're formed. We thought that they're created at this small endoplasmic reticulum where lipid biosynthesis takes place. We're not really quite clear about just exactly what the ro or the root of their production um, actually is. So in that sense, um, yeah, we don't know a huge amount about just exactly um, what it is, the process involved in their in their formation. Sorry, I can't remember the second part. So of can you interfere with their yes, you, formation? You, yeah. so, so that's something that we've been working on. So there are various drugs, which some of them which are now entering clinic, which actually interfere with enzymes, for example, um, which are important in the production of lipid droplets. We know do something about that. Um, and if you interfere with those, with those enzymes and block the production of lipid droplets, then you block production of the virus. And there's some papers um, which have been um, published looking at that. We're also looking at some compounds which um, affect some of the core components of lipid droplets. So, for example, blocking the triglyceride biosynthesis pathway and the effect that that has on, um, on virus production. And what we see is that that definitely does um, have an impact right. on the amount of virus which is produced. And these drugs don't have side effects? Well, some of the ones that we are using in our in vitro studies do. Um, um, and in actual fact, the pharmaceutical industry, in some respects, um, and sort of turned its back on some of these compounds in the past, but many of them are now going back into the clinic again. So I think um, this is a potentially another route for trying to, to, to treat hepatitis C infection. At the moment, we have these directly acting antivirals which target the viral proteins themselves, but clearly targeting host processes is, a, is a, an alternative route. And the advantage of that is that you then do not have the same problem with um, res developing res resistance mutants, which you do have with directly acting antivirals. So I think that in terms of the spectrum of drugs which might be available in the future, we don't only have to think about um, those compounds which directly target viral functions, but we can also think about those which will target um, some of the cellular sure. functions. No, there's a lot of interest in targeting for, for the reason you say that you might get less resistance, but I don't think you, you get zero resistance. I think you can still, a virus can still evolve to be resistant to a drug that targets a cellular yeah. protein. Yeah. So polio, for example, uh, you can, uh, for polio, the membrane, membranous vesicles are needed for RNA synthesis. You can inhibit uh, replication with a drug, brafeldin, which yes. targets a GTPase in the cell, but you can get viruses that are resistant. Yeah. They have a change in a viral protein that somehow gets around the requirement for, for this step. So you can imagine that viruses would do the same. They're very, they're very good at that, but maybe the, the rate is lower, so it's yeah. worth looking into. Many people are doing this, of course. And that actually leads to uh, another question. So you said that lipid droplets are thought to be important for bringing the, the core into the assembly pathway. Could there also be a role in RNA replication uh, on the surface of these, or is that something else? So, so we believe then that replication takes place at modified sites of the ER membrane, very like, much like other positive strand RNA viruses, it shares that, that feature. Um, but what we believe that happens is that somehow through a process that we don't as yet really quite understand, and we think that these, this, there could be interactions between some of the viral proteins, is that in some ways these replication sites come together with sites where there are lipid droplets. And you can see co-localization in cells between lipid droplets and sites where HCV RNA repl replication takes place. And quite clearly, at that point, you have all of the, the ingredients for the basis for um, capsid assembly. So you have the RNA, the replication site, which clearly you have to transfer from the site of replication to a point where you maybe have the core protein on the surface of a droplet. But at that stage, you can begin to imagine that you can have packaging of the RNA and formation of the, of, of the capsid, which clearly would be the first stages in sure. the assembly pathway. Um, one, I have one more question. I could go on and on, but one more. Can you take this conserved core sequence and put it in another flavivirus? Hmm. Um, we, well, so we, so we haven't tried to do that type of experiment. Um, what you can do is you can link it to other, other proteins. So, for example, you can link it to GFP, and that will then target 
um, GFP to the to surface droplet, of to, yeah. to lipid droplet. And that's actually the method that we use to, f to monitor the, mo the mobility of, the, of um, the protein on these lipid droplet structures. So, so it is a transferable element nice. in Good. that sense. Uh, some time ago on TWIV, we talked about a canine hepasivirus. Yeah. Does that have this um, core sequence? Yes, it does have this core sequence. It does have that domain. And the other related virus is GB virus B, which is right. what is found in tamarins. And again, we've done some work to show that that domain is also present on um, in the core protein of GBVB. So it seems to be a conserved domain. And as I said earlier, I think that's perhaps tell us something about the importance of this interaction to the, to yeah. the virus life cycle. It's interesting because if I remember, the, it's not clear that the canine hepasivirus is in fact a, a virus that causes hepatitis in dogs. Right? Oh, I think that's right. It's been, it was detected as a respiratory infection, yeah. but, um, but we now think that maybe the major um, source for that is perhaps not dogs, but could be, could be horses, for example. So there's um, some papers, um, a paper being released recently it shows that, um, in fact, um, if you look at dog populations, then it's very difficult to, de to detect that what was called the canine hepasivirus. But we now see that appears to be that virus is much more prevalent in, in horses. Mm. But again, it's not quite clear just exactly how that's related to, to, to disease. So in horses, we don't know if it's causing hepatitis or no, some other I, disease. I, I think we're far too early in the discovery of the virus to know that. This hasn't been published, right? The horse? Um, yes, it has. It has. Been one, there's been one paper published and there's some work going on, for example, in Edinburgh at the moment also in looking at And it's something that we're interested here with our veterinary colleagues in looking at um, 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 in, in Glasgow. I had one more question, but I forgot. Any, anybody have something they want to ask before we continue? You won't always have an audience. So someday we're going to do live streaming of these from TWIV so we can have a chat room and have people ask questions because that's a very compelling thing to do to have people uh, ask questions as we go along. Uh, Emma, let's talk a little bit about, well, we've talked a bit about your interests, but um, I, from your website, it says you're interested in diversity of the virus and transmission. Is that something that is, so is that correct? You're still interested? I'm still <laughs> interested in that. My, my website's quite new since I'm <laughs> quite new here. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, well, one of the, I guess I have a, an interest uh, in, in the possibility of vaccine development for hepatitis C. And we know that during transmission of hepatitis C, um, a genetic bottleneck occurs. So uh, not all the viruses that the donating partner has will get through into the recipient. And um, there are a number of things that may determine what makes an infectious virus, but uh, I have a, an interest in exploring the genetic diversity in recently transmitted virus, uh, recently transmitted hepatitis C virus, um, particularly uh, interested in looking to see if there are conserved regions within recently transmitted hepatitis C viruses. We know from, from HIV that, uh, that um, transmitted viruses have a slightly different sort of genetic structure um, the, the viral population has a different kind of structure and, and you get a narrowing of the repertoire of um, viruses, viral strains at that time. And so this if is you going could, from uh, the person who's infected, transmitting to another exactly, person. Exactly, yeah. So very similar to HIV. Yes, exactly. Where you exactly. have a different tropism. Yes, although in the population that, that I work with, um, we quite often see transmission of multiple strains of, of virus, unfortunately, in around 40% of those. So uh, in your AIDS population? You yes, yeah, so these are, these are the HIV positive men. But in a non-AIDS population, you usually just have one serotype transmitted? Well, you only um, have one infection usually. Yes, right? it's you, it, it, so there have been studies to suggest that you usually only get one viral strain and that the other strains present uh, when you sample a patient have evolved from that strain. Okay. So you're interested, how do you, how do you monitor this uh, diversity and transmission? What do you do? So um, basically, the, so w what we're doing currently is to amplify the, in the entire hepatitis C viral genome. In the past, um, I've looked very carefully at the envelope of the virus, um, and uh, we looked at correlating the diversity um, in the viral population. So when you get infected, 
with or when you have an infection with hepatitis C, you don't just have one virus, you have this quite what we call a quasi-species, um, which is a population of viruses. And um, what I've been interested in is correlating that um, quasi-species diversity, particularly concentrating on the envelope, um, with outcome, so with either spontaneous, evolving spontaneous clearance of hepatitis C associated with the emergence of an immune response, um, or with evolving progression to chronicity. And what is quite clear is that um, the quasi-species repertoire narrows during uh, early infection in those patients who, have, who develop spontaneous clearance and the lucky 15 to maximum 50% different populations of, of individuals, 15% of my cohort. Um, these are not being treated with antivirals? These are not being treated with antivirals. Um, so that these are people who are raising an effective immune response against the virus. Um, so what you see is a, a very rapid sort of narrowing as, as of the repertoire as each different strain is eliminated by the immune response. Um, in contrast, in evolving progression, what you see is a uh, is a very rapidly expanding population of viruses. But one of the things about the way that hepatitis C evolves, is, uh, which is different from HIV, is that we see uh, strain switching. So at different points over time, uh, we may see a different strain. And um, these strains can disappear uh, from, from plasma at what, any one time point, and then they seem to re-emerge at a later time point. And the likely um, reasoning for that is in part that the virus probably compartmentalizes in different areas um, of the body. So uh, the, the virus replicates in hepatocytes, um, but uh, it may be that there are different colonies uh, within different bits of the liver. Mm -hmm. And also we know that the virus can replicate in extrahepatic sites, so within um, white blood cells and um, also in the brain. So it could be that if you could sample these uh, other sites, because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easy to get blood and to do that, but if you could sample hepatocytes, you might find these populations which disappear in blood, they're still present there. Right? Yes, I suspect that that is uh, a large part of, of the explanation for what we see um, as the virus evolves. But we can't just go and uh, liver biopsy patients regularly because of the, the risks to the patient. Right. And of course we don't have an animal model. No, we, we do have the chimpanzee model um, uh, and the variants seen in the chimpanzee model in the liver do not always reflect what is seen at any one time point in the, in the plasma. So you, you, you mentioned in this study you're looking at envelope sequences, right? And you do deep sequencing so you can look at the diversity? Yes, so one of the things we've been working on um, in, in my patient population is uh, trying to identify when you get what appears to be an entirely new strain uh, at a later time point is whether that is reinfection with another hepatitis C virus or whether this represents a minority variant which was always present but compartmentalized or just present in very low level. Um, and deep sequencing is allowing us to explore that. Um, uh, previously we'd used a cloning techniques and um, we tend to just pull out 20 viruses uh, at a time to, to sequence with that technique but uh, using deep sequencing we can go you know, down to uh, into the thousands at any one time point. How would you tell if the, a new variant emerging was from the host or from some other infection because you don't sample other than blood right? So, uh, so you, you want to know when you see a new variant emerging in the blood you would like to know if it's, it's, a, it's another infection or it's just from a compartment. Exactly. No, that's exactly right. How so, would you tell? So one of the things we're doing is looking at uh, PBMCs, um, so white blood cells, to see if the viral strains there are different, and they are. Um, and it's likely that, um, that they pop in and out of those. We can't look at the liver easily, although one of the projects that I'm working on now is looking at um, paraffin-embedded liver biopsies, which have been taken... Um, from patients when before the diagnosis was, was made. Um, and so we're able to go back retrospectively and amplify virus from those. I don't have results of that yet, but uh, we, we're working on that. So if that works, then you could go back hundreds of years and get 
paraffin embedded. Well, not hundreds, yeah, but yeah, maybe a hundred years. We're working right? on that as well. That would be interesting. Yeah, we're, uh, we're working on that. Because you could recover the whole genomes as they did with influenza in 1918, right? Yes. So that is actually one of the things that we're currently uh, working on. How far on back do samples. we have paraffin embedded samples stored? Do we know? In Glasgow, we, we have acquired some from the 1960s and 70s and, and one from 1911. Um, which, uh, <laughs> 1911, that's good. What uh, is the, so what is the earliest date of hep C in people? We have some estimates of that, right? So we think the virus is at around 2,000 years old, but that's based on, and that's based on molecular clock analysis yeah. of, of, of genetic sequences. I so it's quite recall, an old there's virus. Some, there's some evidence linking it to 40s, 30s and 40s in humans, some emergence, right? Yes, yeah, so there have been expansions of the virus, and this again is based on molecular clock um, information. Um, and, uh, so Oli Pibus in, in Oxford has written a number of papers on this. And we know that there have been expansions associated with the Industrial Revolution, um, and then subsequently um, with the emergence of intravenous drug use um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and yes, there was also some expansion in the early 1900s, probably associated with medical treatments. And yeah. It would be interesting if you can get virus out of those sections, because then that opens up a that lot would be of, very nice. of, of archaeology that you could do. And if anyone would like to send me liver biopsies from, uh, yeah. from a long time ago, we'd be happy to look at I'm them. sure they exist somewhere, right? Uh, they must, because uh, it's quite an old technique. I mean, they were doing lung sections in 1918. So it must at least be there, if not earlier. So that would be very interesting. Now, when you uh, when you um, sequence when you deep sequence viruses, say from blood of a patient, how many different viral sequences can you detect in a in a given sample, roughly? So the the deepest that I've gone down to is thirty thousand um, at any one time point, right. and. I chose to look at a patient who I knew was co-infected with two viruses, genotype 1 and genotype 4, mm -hmm. um, to see how many variants there are. And, and, and um, basically, around 15,000 of, of each were, well, a bit less, about 12,000 of each were, were either genotype one, uh, 1, genotype 1 strain or 1, genotype 4 <coughs> strain. But there were hundreds of okay. minority variants present. Um, and that's presumably part of the quasi-species, right? It's not yes. the whole, you, you can't get the whole quasi-species for technical reasons, I think, right? Yes, yeah, so one of the problems we have is that we still, up, well, up until recently, have had to use PCR-based techniques um, to amplify the virus. Right, and, and that uh, biases, That right? biases, yeah. <clears throat> so you, you get a certain sort of sampling window, but not necessarily a view of the whole viral population. Right. And. Um, but there have been real advances in the possibilities of sequencing um, recently, and uh, we're very much hoping to, to start looking directly at, um, at viral RNA and sequence it directly using mm -hmm. deep sequencing uh, without an amplification step. Right, right. That's my understanding that eventually it will be uh, accurate enough so that you can directly sequence and get a real sense of the quasi-species. You yeah, have a I think that would be fascinating. Virus. How many different <laughs> virus genomes are in there? We have yeah. a theoretical idea, but it would be nice to see them. And, and it would be nice to compare uh, data that been, you know, put together through bias techniques, PCR sure. cloning, sure. etc., and compare that with direct sequencing of, of Yeah, and then once you can do that, you can look in patients and get a real idea of what's exactly. happening. So, have you also looked at the effects of antiviral treatments on this on the populations? Uh, so I have looked at the the likelihood of response to treatment based on pre prior um, uh, uh, quasi species diversity, and quite clearly, and this is not something that's um, we've had it in abstract form, but not um, published yet. But uh, there is clearly a, a big difference in, um, in diversity, uh, and it's, so if you have a much larger diversity, then you're much less likely to respond to treatment. Um, and, and other people have shown that. Uh, in and other populations. you can also look at the emergence of known resistance. So I think right? this was something that, that will be very, very interesting. And looking at the emergence of resistance uh, at time points in patients on therapy, I think will be very important because 
Uh, you would hope that if you were using a triple therapy based regimen that even if there are one or two variants which carry a you know, protease inhibitor resistance mutation that they'll be knocked out by interferon and, and ribavirin. So I think what will be interesting is to look and see if these populations emerge over time um, uh, under the, the positive selection pressure of treatment. Right. So one final question. Would you is it possible to have an at-risk population that you could sample periodically and, and detect a new infection uh, and track it from the very first days of infection? It, with hepatitis C infection, yeah. 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 So uh, the, the HIV positive cohort that I work with, that is something that we have done because these guys um, have, they come in regularly uh, for follow-up for HIV, and so we and we store the the blood samples for up to ten years. So we're able to go back uh, uh, retrospectively and identify the exact point of, of infection. So that that's why that population has started to answer questions about early hepatitis C infection in general, and not just in HIV in the context of HIV. Uh, looking at uh, at-risk populations for hepatitis C is another is something that we're trying to establish here in Glasgow because we obviously have um, a lot of incident infection and uh, largely an intravenous drug user population. But the challenge is to to manage to follow up these patients. Um, and I'm aware that in the states there have been some studies, uh, you know, recruiting patients by, you know, paying them. Ten dollars or whatever to come in and just have a test, and then over time you you, you can um, you can get a population of people. It's very interesting. I've heard a number of AIDS clinicians talk about their cohorts, and they get very dedicated cohorts who are interested in helping, you know, everyone. So they come in rather regularly and have samples taken, and that's what you really need to do. This, yeah, I think right? it's a great cohort of people to work with. Yeah. They're young. A relatively healthy, um, interested, right. Um, right, and a very well-read, largely mm -hmm. population of people, and uh, and so, yes, uh, they're often philanthropic as well, and very happy to take part in studies. Do you think it would be possible one day to, if deep sequen sequencing was were perfect and we could identify the entire quasi species? to see at day zero someone who acquired a quasi-species and you could find out who it came from because every one would be unique. Right? Yeah, I think that would be really <laughs> interesting. And I think, I think perhaps the best way to get a handle on that would be to know who the donor was because you might see HLA-related footprints in the sequence. And um, yeah, it's likely that there will be signatures associated with that one patient and with the donor. Because now already in, in HIV cases, uh, criminal cases, you can, right. you can do that, right? I mean, the problem with those, you know, with, there have been prosecutions um, based on phylogenetic evidence and, uh, uh, in, in HIV, and, and obviously the, the risk is there that we might start getting prosecutions in people with hepatitis C also. The problem is that as, thing, as technology is now, we can't tell if if a virus which is exactly the same as the virus from the person who's who's given it to the recipient has gone via another person. Sure. And, and uh, that's an important caveat to state, I guess, in a court of law. Right, but uh, currently, right, but the techniques but will the improve. Yeah, I think so. I think, I, I think there's the possibility that that will happen. I mean, you know, people talk about the implications of genome sequencing for insurance and healthcare and all of this, but someday we will, when you go for routine checkups, you'll also have your virome sequenced. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that information might also be used at some point for it, because this will be in a database and they can match up donors with, with people who are infected and could have various implications. So the science as it improves goes way beyond just research. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Forensic epidemiologist. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, in, in, uh, in veterinary medicine, I think has been uh, used quite effectively in, during outbreaks of foot and mouth disease, and actually to tracking the virus from farm to farm, uh, right. how that the virus has been uh, transmitted. Sure. So that's sure. there is a bit more at the farm level rather than individual level, but uh, I think is already is already there. Can yeah, for polio as well, we can track uh, viruses moving from country yeah, to country. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of forensics, forensics. it's a whole new uh, career. It's not just TV shows anymore, right? <laughs> right? 
Now, Massimo, you don't work on Hep C, right? No, I don't work on. Do Hep you want C. to? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm very proud of the people that uh, do the, the job in the, in the center, so they don't need me. Can we talk a little bit about your very interesting uh, sheep vi retrovirus? Yeah, because we've never talked about <coughs> this on Twiv, and I don't even know how to pronounce the name. That's uh, Yak City, I think. But uh, probably if there are twigs that uh, uh, from uh, South Africa or speak Africans, right. uh, might my, my, my not be happy with my pronunciation. So I, I spoke with Megan Shaw a few weeks ago. Probably some right. people know Megan, right? Yeah. And she pronounced it perfectly because <laughs> she's from South Africa. But I yeah. can't reproduce it. So. Um, so this is the retrovirus that you first worked on with Hung, is that right? That's right. I did my PhD and then I, I moved to Hung with, with, a, with a piece of tumor and uh, to try to get an infectious molecular clone that, uh, that we did. So uh, you yeah. had, as a PhD student, studied the tumor in sheep? Yeah, we're studying differentiating at the time the difference between exogenous and endogenous viruses. So the sheep are these exogenous viruses that can be transmitted and uses lung cancer. And then, but every ship in the planet has uh, equivalent of these viruses in their genome, and these are endogenous viruses. And, and over the years, we studied both exogenous and endogenous viruses. And, uh, so the, the exogenous virus is transmitted, and this causes the lung tumor. That's right. And the, its interesting feature is that uh, it's, the, it's a unique uh, among all oncogenic viruses to, for having a, a structural protein. So the envelope protein of the virus is actually a dominant oncoprotein. So simply the expression of the protein within the cells causes cells to transform. Only the envelope genes. Only the right? envelope. And, and this is from the evolutionary point of view for a virus is very interesting because how can you have a virus that from the moment expresses a lot of, pro of, uh, of uh, protein mm -hmm. that it needs to, to then make viral progeny that transmit it from animal to animal how can happen and then induce a cancer and kills, the, and kills it, its host. And uh, so we study for a number of years this, and I think we figure out how that works. And you want to know how, Yes, right? how does it work? <laughs> yeah, sure. so, so can you just, do you yeah. need the nucleic acid of the envelope or just the protein? Is that sufficient? Uh, you, need the, well, you need the nucleic acid because you need to have an abundant expression. It's not just a single hit. So you need to have abundant expression. That's how the virus actually flies under the radar in terms of uh, in sheep. So the virus can infect a lot of different cell types, but only in the target cells for transformation is where the virus is expressed at its best. And that's where it's able then to transform it. So normally uh, the, the virus can infect several different types, but there is only a window of opportunity for the virus to infect uh, the, the cells that can be transformed. And this window of opportunity is either in a lump, so when, when, the, when the, the lung is basically growing and you have progenitors of, uh, of a particular cell, cell in the lung, there's the type 2 pneumocytes that are dividing. So retroviruses, most retroviruses except HIV, need cells actively dividing. And so when during, in a, in a, in a, in a young lump, these cells, there are these progenitor cells are dividing and then the virus can get in. And the virus actually, transform these cells, but it's quite slow in, in, in inducing a full-blown cancer. And when you have the cells are transforming, so they carry more virus, and the, there's more virus that is released, and it's released through the, the respiratory route, and then probably then how it's transformed. So this is one window. So of is transformation required for this efficient spread? We, we think that uh, probably uh, helps, helps to amplify for sure. We think that uh, we, we, we kept a sort of artificial flock for, a, for, for some time and without a full-blown clinical disease, we, we still could see trans uh, tran uh, transmission of the virus. Uh, some um, investigators seem to, to show that they can be transmitted through the milk as well from, from uh, mother to lamb. Um, that uh, all, all the ways how the virus is transmitted probably is what are not completely clear. So it's cl it helps m for efficient transmission, but it's not essential. Yeah, we, th we, think, we think that this is not essential. Because the reason I'm asking is because for the known mam other mammalian retroviruses yeah, yeah. that either pick up an oncogene yeah. or insertionally activate yeah. or transactivate, yeah. Yeah. it's an accident yeah, to transform that's right. cells. That's right. And so here the accident is not the integration event, but the accident is the infection of these target cells for transformation. And so this happened again, I said, when the, 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 the animal is young, or if there is a concomitant infection with other bacteria, other viruses, parasites, then there is the cells that, that are, are there is a, a, a damage in the lung, 
and then the, the progenital cells start to be activated to repair this damage. And there again, there is a there is the opportunity for the virus to, to enter these cells. So that's how it's been then the virus and host co-evolved. And there's another, I think, example, because when we're talking about the HIV or how animal viruses, study of animal viruses have really influenced uh, biomedicine in, in general. So for HIV, we give it for granted that uh, a virus infects a, a patient, uh, an individual, and then clinical signs can appear months or years after the initial infection. Um, so this one, we, you know, every PhD student now knows that that is a, is a, is a possibility. However, the, the first time that really this has been rigorously observed was studying a group of diseases of sheep, the Yuxiate is one of them, uh, that are called slow diseases of sheep. And, uh, and uh, uh, this was uh, when there was a, a small group of uh, rams and they were shipped from Germany to Iceland. So Iceland is the middle of nowhere. So that's, uh, they had uh, uh, sheep farming, uh, very active sheep, uh, uh, sheep farming population. They needed to, to sort of refresh their genetic uh, uh, lines. And so they imported 13 rams from Germany. This is in the, in the 30s. And at the time, they already the very well uh, um, established concept of infectious diseases. So they, they, they kept these rams for six months in isolation. So nothing happened to these, to these rams. And then they released in the general, in the general population. And uh, they introduced uh, Yak City, they introduced Medivisna, and they introduced uh, a, a bacterial disease, uh, paratuberculosis, and probably also Scraby, although Scraby was already present in the island. So that, that, uh, that uh, a, a, a physician, um, a, a physician actually was a medic, uh, Sigurdsson, who studied these diseases. And, uh, and Medivisna is, uh, is, uh, so was, is caused by retrovirus, and uh, is a retrovirus, that was the prototype of uh, of uh, lentiviruses, lent is in Greek for slow, and has been the prototype for a long time until HIV came along. And, but the, and the, the, all the understanding of HIV at the very early stages was all based on, on animal retroviruses and all these studies. And so I think that's what, a bit what we do in the center. So we, viruses, you know, for, for your listeners, really there is no difference of virus or an animal or a human. There are viruses, the same virus can infect human and animals, so different viruses can infect only animals, only humans, but that they're really the same thing. And so if we study them, we can learn just for that particular system, but that also sure. for Sure. No, I think a lot of our quick advance in HIV came, uh, say, in developing protease inhibitors, came from our understanding of retroviral proteases, of mouse uh, retroviruses and avian retroviruses. And if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have been able to progress. So that's absolutely the, the, one of the main arguments for studying animal models of, of animal virus infection, not humans. Yeah. So how does the envelope protein transform cells? Well, I think we, we know a lot of uh, uh, the, the, all the signal transduction pathway of how this happens. Uh, you know, the PF3K, KT pathway seems to be important. The uh, ERK, MAP, kinase is important. But really, we haven't. One of the things that uh, probably we haven't completely figured out is how does it start? So what, it, what are the proteins that, uh, that uh, the envelope binds at the beginning and then the, the cell surface? Uh, the cell surface, that's how, what we think. That's but it's how not we the receptor that the virus would no, use, it does, no? No, it's not the receptor. So it, the, the, the virus um, uh, the, the uses a receptor that, uh, um, for example, can't use a receptor, a mouse receptor, but to transform efficiently uh, mouse cells. So this is one, one of the things that really we, uh, we don't... Uh, we, we don't know so the that idea is. is that it's binding some other receptor. You know a lot of the signaling events that occur subsequently. So, correct. And th and the the event the uh, down of the eventual event is some mitogenic stimulation which causes the cells to divide That's continuously. Right. That's right. right. So we know all downstream, but I okay. think uh, upstream is is the that has, we've been chasing it for a while and uh, and. Uh, um, we've never been able to crack it. Okay. Well, you will because modern techno proteomic technologies now let you to do those kinds of experiments, right? That's what we thought. But, <laughs> 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 but uh, with, uh, yeah, I guess with membrane proteins, it's a bit more complicated than, uh, yeah. than uh, we've been. Uh, so are there any, there's no other retrovirus that we know about where the protein, the envelope transforms cells, the correct? Structural protein, uh, yeah, the whole envelope. There's a, there's a the, the friend, Murin Lugino, that uh, he has a, has a defective envelope that is really, in essence, uh, uh, um, act as a, a transduce oncogene, really. Uh, but that's, uh, that, 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 that's the main one. All right. Very good. Well, that's, I, I've always been fascinated by 
the sheep retrovirus. And I think that's a great uh, example of how we need to study um, what, uh, what animal viruses do to animals to get some insight. Now, one of the um, important parts of TWIV is our audience, and they always send us emails. We get several every day, and we read them on each episode. I want to read a few just to give you a sense, and I also picked some that I thought might be relevant for our panel today. And the first one is from Katharina, who writes, I know that TWIV 166 was specific to a possible therapeutic agent against Hep C, but I was wondering what difficulties are preventing the development of a viable HCV vaccine? Do you think that the determination of the transmitted slash founder HCV viral sequence is necessary for vaccine development, or are there other factors in HCV vaccine development that need to be worked out as well? So she could have been right, you, right? You sent it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said that there earlier. The false name. Since <laughs> <laughs> your middle name is Catherine. <laughs> we have a great audience uh, in TWIV. We really do. Yeah, that's, yeah. I hope those questions are, that's really relevant. And uh, um, So I think there are a number of problems with developing a good vaccine for hepatitis C. Um, the first of which is the variability of the virus. And um, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, even more variable than HIV is. Um, you have something like 10 to the 12 viruses produced every day. There are six to seven genotypes. Um, and um, so it's a tough target to, you know, to get a vaccine which must incorporate um, either that uh, it must incorporate some way of inducing cross-reactive um, immune responses. Um, we know that in hepatitis C infection, probably the, the, well, the B cell response and the T cell response are important in limiting infection. But the B cell response tends to be targeted against um, envelope, which is very variable and can be very specific to one individual. So choosing to vaccinate in that way is probably not going to be successful. Um, therefore, uh, looking for um, a vaccine which, which can induce T cells is the challenge, really. Um, uh, at least part of the challenge, I think you're going to have to induce T cell responses as well. Um, and um, what we know about T cell responses and immunity to hepatitis C is that those responses um, in people who spontaneously clear the virus must target multiple areas of the, of the, of the virus. Um, they also tend to be restricted by your HLA type. So there are all sorts of complications and, and reasons why a vaccine is going to be difficult to develop. I think one of the, I have to advertise uh, Ellie Barnes and Paul Klenemann's um, advance with the adenoviral um, vaccine that they've developed in, in Oxford. Um, this is um, basically um, a, a vaccine which is based on adenovirus 6, which is a rare um, virus of humans and chimpanzee adenovirus 3. And um, so the, the non-structural um, part of the, the hepatitis C genome is put into this, this uh, virus. And um, we know that in uh, healthy volunteers, this appears to induce very strong T cell responses. Um, it's a gen genotype 1B um, strain that has been used. Um, but I think there are two things that seem to be encouraging. Um, uh, uh, the first is that the responses uh, are sustained. So the, the People are vaccinated with this virus and uh, they, they have responses out to one year. And that the responses are large and certainly in keeping with the kind of responses that you see in people who spontaneously clear infection, in fact, they're higher. And um, also that there is some evidence of cross-specificity. So when you uh, take um, cells from patients who had the healthy volunteers who've been vaccinated and you stimulate those cells with peptides um, from genotype 1A and also genotype 3, uh, there are also um, 
reasonably high um, responses. So uh, this is encouraging, but we have no idea yet whether this virus will um, help to prevent infection in at-risk populations. So we have to hold our, our breath a bit and see um, if that uh, if if there is clinical efficacy, and I, I think that's the big question. It would be really interesting to see what happens with that. So this was a phase one. Yes. Right. And has any other candidate gone to phase one? Um, there, the, yeah, there have been a, a number. I guess that's the one that I'm the, the yeah. that's the sort of um, the one that's been the most recent uh, development. The, the, there, there have been other ones, and I think part of the difficulty is actually knowing what to put into the vaccine. Um, because, for example, putting core into the vaccine may not be a good thing. And we know that, that people who have immune responses um, directed against core um, uh, in, in certain uh, studies have been shown to, to be more likely to progress, actually, yeah. um, rather than to um, clear the virus. And so trying to pick out those bits of the virus that are, mm -hmm. that are going to be protective is really important. And I think... Um, the question about founder viruses is really, you know, the second part of that question is is quite critical because if we do find that there, you know, that there are conserved regions that uh, that can be used in a vaccine which are immunogenic, then those would be the regions to look at. And your studies that we talked about earlier are addressing. That, yeah, so right? I'm planning to to yeah. look at that. All right. Uh, the next one is from uh, Ming Yi who writes in uh, TWIV 177 when talking about Schmallenberg virus. This is for, I think you're interested in Schmallenberg, right? It was mentioned that the presence of virus in livestock has not affected livestock consumption and that farmers do not need to notify authorities if a deformed animal, possibly as a result of the virus, is born. This strikes me as a risky policy as we do not know if the virus would mutate and be transmitted to humans. Therefore, I was wondering when and how the governments decide on policies to regulate the sale of livestock when an unknown virus is involved. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a regulatory issue which, which I have no idea about, but maybe you have some thoughts. Well, I, I think uh, the, the, the regulators uh, in general, as a, I guess as a general statement, will get involved, uh, will get involved, right? they get always involved, but will put restriction in, in, uh, in, a, in infectious diseases of livestock uh, for two reasons, I guess. One, if there is a, uh, um, the, the pathogen is risking to get spread into the, the general population of livestock and uh, create big problems, so outbreaks of, for example, foot and mouth disease and major problems. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, there has to be in place uh, a strong uh, um, policy control to uh, avoid the spreading of that disease to different countries or within that country. So that, that's one case. And the other case, if there is, for example, a risk to, to humans, which Smallenberg, it seems to be pretty clear that, uh, that there is no, uh, there's been no, no risk, uh, no, doesn't seem to be a major, major uh, problem for the for the livestock. I thought this creating problem. We'll have to wait and see what the, f the the extent of the problem if it increases. But the moment doesn't seem to be so, and uh, um, the, the the doesn't seem to be transmissible transmissible to to humans. So the, the, I guess the regulators doing the right thing because if you then start to intervene, you create a lot of problems and a lot of economical problems without reasons. Now. The 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 uh, the listener asks uh, why it could mutate and could be transmitted to humans, but that is true for essentially then any virus. So yeah, you could, sure. you could mutate that you never know. Uh, so there has to be the right balance between uh, um, to, to to strike here. I think. Yeah, that's it. There always has to be a balance because yeah. if we're super paranoid about everything, we yeah, don't that, we don't function. That's right. right. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, the next one is from <laughs> Catherine, who writes. Is this from you again? <laughs> <laughs> this has to do with flu. I had a question in response to TWIV 173 in regards to the influenza discovered in bats in Guatemala. What are the next steps for monitoring the spread and mutations of this virus? Does the CDC really have enough funding and manpower to follow up and monitor every new virus that is discovered? <laughs> I don't know if you know, this was a, a, a study, a collaboration of the CDC and, and local people in Guatemala they discovered a new uh, influenza virus in bats, which is now thought to be the H17 uh, HA type of flu. 
Well, WHO follows up as much as possible all the new strains with a network that is called Global Influenza Surveillance and Response Network. It is one of the oldest established networks in WHO. I think they've been in effect since <coughs> early 50s. And the, there are national influenza centers that are laboratories all over the world, mm -hmm. some hundreds. I can't remember the exact number, but they um, collect samples right. and then they are uh, analyzed to see if there are new strains or what's happening globally around the world in, in terms of flu. Mm -hmm. And this information is then used to develop uh, or recommend the vaccine strain of that year. So, it, I mean, it's, it's not only CDC, but CDC is one of the reference laboratories of, uh, if, of that network, the GISSERS, uh, collaborating with WHO on that. So I think they are pretty well covering. So if world. this, uh, would this bat uh, flu sequence be told, would these laboratories, these collaborating labs be told to look for this if they found it in a human sample? Uh, anything that is new is communicated yeah. uh, among these people and groups. So they have a very good collaboration uh, with, with, I think they have six reference laboratories around the globe and some hundreds of national influenza centers. So they communicate very well. So it's really not a big issue because if you have these labs set up, you just have another sequence to look for, and that's that's pretty straightforward. So that's a good that's a good point that there is already this global network for flu. So you just use that. Uh, Let's set it up for hepatitis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. All right. The last one is from uh, C M. Now, I, I gave my virology. I teach an undergraduate virology course at Columbia, and one of their assignments every year is to listen to one of my podcasts and uh, to, to send in a question to get them to think about virology. They all actually end up listening a lot because they really think it's pretty cool that I'm teaching this course and I do a podcast, so uh, they're pretty engaged. Uh, I've heard strong statements about the importance of publication, how science only moves by publication, and how the scientists have to publish everything. And I can't help but to agree that it's very true. My thoughts are with Wendy Barclay's comment on the censorship, that it can possibly block other bright minds from accessing information that can be detrimental to scientific research progress and discovery. This, of course, had to do with the H5N1 issue. As I was reading comments on the TWIV video in Dublin, I strongly received the impression that such opposition to publishing still exists. Besides all the political pressure that may be present, there was a concern about virulent virus information falling into the wrong hands, like terrorists, for example. Are they speaking from previous experiences? It's <laughs> <laughs> a great point. As an undergraduate student, just touching upon this subject, I don't think I know enough about the history of virology, hence it made me wonder. Was there such an instance where such publication and disclosure of information went terribly wrong or misused? Or is this from too much Hollywood movies? So I think it's great that an undergraduate <laughs> has this perspective of the situation. Any, any thoughts? It's too much Hollywood movies, yeah. maybe. <laughs> that's, that's part of it. And uh, there is the censorship on one hand. There is, uh, we're, we're building a new, a new, um, a new, as you know, a new building for our for our uh, research center, and uh, and of course we work with some uh, with some viruses uh, like Hep C, or work also with some viruses of animals that could be maybe transmitted, and so even also just the building, how you build a research center is highly regulated as well. Um, so I think again maybe we should use the balance word again and try to yeah. find the right balance yeah. between. Uh, don't be absolutely paranoid, and uh, and uh, but have some some basic uh, um, and to be careful sometimes, but not too much. I don't know of any example where a sequence or some result has been used to do bioterrorism. Right? Also, because nature is more of a terrorist. Yeah, isn't it? For sure, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's nature just just does it. Yeah. So that is is very it's very hard to to repeat that. Yeah. There was, of course, bioterrorism well before we started publishing yeah. genetic sequence yeah. data. Flu uh, f or uh, plague victims being uh, thrown over the walls of medieval cities. Uh, and uh, um, mm -hmm. perhaps it's, it's um, perhaps you don't really need the, the genetic sequence of flu to, to consider these uh, 
acts. And yeah, I think that if you wanted to use a biological agent, you would use an existing one, uh, plague, for example, or some others. But modification, I think, is so iffy. The H5N1 is a great example. I mean, we have no idea how this virus would behave in people. It's a ferret passaged virus. So yeah, I think the likelihood, the, I think when you do terrorism, not speaking from experience, but <laughs> the, the terrorist wants whatever they're doing to work, and there's too much uncertainty in biological terrorism uh, that it's, I don't think it's a good choice. I just think it's a threat in that we respond to threats uh, by spending a lot of effort and money. But you have to balance, I think. And I think the, the terrorist weapons that work, the bombs and the guns, we should focus on. And the biological agents, I think there's, there's more benefit from publishing than, uh, than to worry about bioterrorism. Unfortunately, at least in the U.S., we have a huge anti-bioterror establishment now. People get PhDs in, in this sort of thing. And... Um, there are entire departments of universities devoted to this. There are, there are departments in the government which spend lots of money on this. And I personally think it is a lot of misguided effort because although it's fine to be careful, uh, I, I think it's very unlikely that anything will ever be done. This is my own personal opinion. I think we're pouring money that could go into basic research into things that are not useful. But, um, you know, I've, I've spoken out about this, so... I don't need to belabor the point. I think the other thing is we've now had genetic modification of viruses for well nigh 40 years. Um, and through that process, as far as I know, we've never accidentally produced any right. very dangerous pathogen because it's always highly regulated. So even, um, even by accident, we haven't created anything either. Now in my experience, you know, every time you modify a virus, you attenuate it because you're introducing changes that you want for your particular, you, you want to modify core protein, but they always end up attenuating virulence because nature hasn't selected for these in, in animals. You can never say it won't happen, right? That's the problem. This is little possibility that it might, and that's what <laughs> people grab onto, unfortunately, but that's, that's because we're not balancing properly, I think. But this is a topic we could talk about for ages and ages, and it's another important one, just like uh, genomic sequencing and predictors of disease. This is another issue that uh, everyone has to deal with. And when I first started, and you probably remember starting in science, this wasn't an issue at all. Right. Nobody ever talked about this. And as we say, we had the pathogens, but it's just, it's a recent addition. All right, the, the other thing we do in TWIV is we do a pick of the week. We pick something in science that we think would be of interest to our listeners, and I have one uh, today. Uh, I've been on a, on a kick about microbial art the past few episodes of TWIV. So uh, last week I picked the website of a painter in Virginia who paints, uh, does watercolors with a microbial theme. And I saw her art at an exhibition. And in fact, I bought one of her pictures and you saw it yesterday in my presentation. Uh, so a number of individuals have sent me other websites with microbial art. And so I want to pick those. Uh, one, is from, one is called Phage Art from the Rower Lab, and they have wonderful pictures of uh, bacteriophages. Uh, there is a, a virologist in the U.S. who makes uh, virus beads. So she, you, you sew beads together, and she makes virus particles out of them. So there's a web page uh, for those. And then there's another page at ASM for phage art as well. So I'm collecting all of these microbial art sites on a web page, virology.com, sorry, virology.ws slash art. And I think it'll be interesting to see how many of those, how many artists are inspired by microbes of all different sorts. Another way of bringing uh, microbiology to the general public. We also do a listener pick of the week. And this one is from Judy, who writes, to our TWIV leaders, if you have a Mac with apps, please go to the App Store and download cell images. I think you'll have a great time going through them. So this is a little app that's full of images of cells. It's pretty cool. It's free. So thanks for that. One other thing, I listen to your show on science reform with interest, but I have one request. Please do not ever apologize for having the passion and the integrity to follow your avocation of science or writing or fishing. So many of our students are lost because they do not see people who have that sort of devotion and caring about their career work, and our kids need you to be role models. You do the twivs out of love of the subjects. You take thoughtful and justified stands on controversial issues 
and you are willing to share yourselves and your somewhat twisted humor with, with your audience. In short, you are good people who care about your work and your world. Please don't stop. You are allowed to toot your own horns about this. As they say, it ain't boasting if it's true. And Judy is a high school teacher in California who has written this to us uh, numerous times, and she says, P.S., thanks for my professional development. So she says we help with her professional development as a high school biology teacher. We help give her ideas uh, about what to talk about. So this is great that we can provide a resource that can be used at that level as well. So that is TWIV 188. Uh, we, are we do this every week, and uh, we put the episodes on iTunes at twiv.tv and at microbeworld.org slash twiv. We also have a fan page on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. And many of the photos I've taken during my visit here in Glasgow <laughs> will be there to see and to show the world what virologists do uh, when and they visit. And look like. And look like <laughs> as well. Yes, you have to see what we look like. We also have an app that you can use to listen to the episodes on your iPhone or Android device. That's at microbe world.org. And of course, we love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I want to thank everybody uh, for participating today. Massimo, thank you so much. You're welcome. P appreciate ha uh, having me here and allowing us uh, to do this as well. Uh, Emma Thompson, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Pleasure you. Pleasure talking to you with you and about your work. John McLaughlin, thank you very much. Enjoy your whiskey. <laughs> uh, I don't have any. <laughs> I can give you some. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for, for introducing me to, uh, to a new one last night. I appreciate that. Uh, and from WHO Honda, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. May well. I just say one thing Absolutely. before we close? Uh, we have a listserv uh, at WHO and for the Global Hepatitis Program, and anybody who's interested in knowing what WHO is doing, mm -hmm. um, we send out regular. Um, emails to this listserv about one every two weeks so it's not going to clutter your mailboxes uh, if you want to subscribe you can just send an email write subscribed in the in the subject box the email to hepatitis at who.int hepatitis at who.int and we will put you on our listserv and you will be informed of what who is doing on viral hepatitis very good i'm going to do that right away thank, thank you, you. Excellent. I, I also want to thank uh, Steve for helping out with the audio. Thanks very much for backing me up there. And anything else? What did I forget? Ah, thanks to the audience. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it very much. I am Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at my website, virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. <laughs>